afternoon. Today's uh, video conference is um, the final step in a collaborative initiative between the Canadian Partnership for Children's Health and Environment and the Ontario Chronic Disease Prevention Alliance, and I'll be referring to KIPCHI and OCDPA as I go through these slides. My uh, presentation is going to hit the high points of a lot of mountains of material. Uh, the first part of the report is, is about context for this collaboration. The second part is a review of the evidence. We did a scoping review. Um, there's a detailed introduction to look at some overarching concepts and then I'll run through five areas of chronic disease and wrap up with some overall observations and conclusions. So to start with some context, um, in 25 years, by 2036, 25% of Canadians are going to be over the age of 65. And there's a prediction that an awful lot of them are going to be um, suffering one or more chronic diseases. Um, some pretty apocalyptic language gets used by um, some of the groups who've, who've uh, summarized the information about this, uh, these trends in the population. Uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation refers to a perfect storm of risk factors for cardiovascular disease. The Alzheimer's Society refers to the rising tide of dementia. Um, we are within uh, the context in Canada of a, an epidemic of obesity within the context of a global pandemic. Um, also, the Diabetes Association refers to the economic tsunami we can expect from the cost of diabetes. In the Cancer Society, they don't bother with the apocalyptic language, they just give us the cold hard facts, the statistics, one in four of us will die from cancer, nearly half of us will get cancer. And there has been a fourfold increase since 1980 in children with asthma, although those numbers are leveling off a bit. The projections are for multi-millions of, of Canadians to be affected with multi-billions of, of dollars in projected costs. And the effect is worse um, among those living in poverty. Uh, the report goes into quite a lot of detail about the, the range and scope of environmental exposures that um, Will, uh, that exist and, and that it considers, but this slide just summarizes the results from biomonitoring, which confirms that we are all exposed to um, large numbers of very small levels of uh, toxic substances. Um, levels are higher in children and um, highest in breastfed babies. We, we talk about people being at the top of the food chain, but in fact our breastfed babies occupy that position. We don't know the consequences of these low levels, and it should not deter women from ever, never should it deter women from breastfeeding their, their babies. Um, on the Kipchi side of this collaborative, we have spent a lot of time summarizing very solid evidence that the fetus and child are more vulnerable to environmental exposures for the reasons outlined here. They're more exposed for their, uh, because of behavioral reasons, physiological reasons, um, proportionality compared to adults. Um, toxic substances can cross the placenta, and they are more susceptible because of the dynamic processes of development in the, in the womb and, and during childhood um, and immature um, systems for dealing with exposure to su toxic substances. And again, poverty increases these, these risks. Children in First Nations communities are likely at greatest risk. Again, summarizing the, um, the research uh, from that Kipchi has summarized, um, some of the health problems that are, are associated with environmental exposures are summarized on this slide. Um, impacts on the, uh, on the respiratory system, the immune system, the developing brain, a range of, of effects in, on reproduction and development, a number of cancers, often related to um, impacts mediated through the endocrine system. Of course, there are many causes for all of these kinds of effects. Environmental evidence is often incomplete as I'll talk about later, but the risks are high stakes, obviously. Um, and often the worst contaminants are associated with several of these effects. So as um, for all of those, those outcomes, as I mentioned, they result from multiple determinants. And the same is true for chronic disease. Um, this illustration is, was developed by the World Health Organization, the, the 12 multiple determinants of health. Um, uh, within chronic disease, it's really well understood um, what some key risk factors are for, for most chronic diseases. There's a, a big focus on what are called the big three, diet, exercise, and smoking. And then the biomedical factors are the intermediate conditions often related to those. So uh, abnormal blood lipids, high cholesterol, uh, abdominal obesity, um, hypertension, etc. Um, but that is certainly not the full story, um, although it tends to be where we focus most of our attention in terms of, of risk factors. And in particular, the, the, 
there's criticism actually about um, the fact that it doesn't give enough attention or indeed primacy to the social determinants of health and there's a very um, extensive literature that um, assures us that worldwide rich and poor countries health follows that gradient of, of socioeconomic status the social determinants are referred to the as the causes of the causes so the underlying reasons for those behavioral or biomedical risk factors um, the World Health Organization refers to it as an ethical imperative to address these these issues Likewise, the Canadian Medical Association pre president uh, back in 2009 talked about poverty as the greatest predictor of health. Canada's and Ontario's medical, chief medical officers of health have made the same kinds of statements. And when we do not um, attend to the social determinants of health, we have a situation where we can undermine individual behavioral or choices to achieve better health, including the ability to adopt uh, different behavioral choices at all. And the same thing, uh, the same concern about the, um, in, within that framing of the multiple determinants of health, that it doesn't really explain the, the breadth of issues with respect to environmental determinants. The main focus of this report is, is uh, indoor and outdoor um, exposures, basically from different from air, water, soil, etc. But there are other areas summarized on this slide that are, that are um, also relevant. So there's land use planning in the built environment, our car dependent lifestyle, um, the air resulting air pollution and climate change, our sedentary lifestyles, um, and resulting overweight and obesity. As well we have an increasingly mechanized um, and fossil fuel dependent food system and it is clearly a major contributor to climate change but also the, um, the glut of uh, inexpensive sources of unhealthy food. Um, and when we talk about climate change over the next 25 years, this is where the environmental side of this equation can starts to use the apocalyptic language because it is indeed uh, troubling <clears throat> what we can expect as if the, um, these catastrophic weather events continue to occur with extreme heat, et cetera. Um, and they're uh, expected to affect some of the most fundamental determinants of health, so air, water, food, and shelter. And then finally, there are interactions across all of these. Environment is like the social determinants um, in terms of being cross-cutting, cross um, and lo there's lots of interaction, especially with the social determinants. Um, in low-income communities, we know there's higher air pollution related uh, hospitalization and mortality, uh, greater exposure to toxic substances as a result of substandard housing or the use and reuse of older consumer products, um, greater use of canned food, that sort of thing. Um, and we also know that the worst effects of climate change are predicted to occur among the poor and the elderly. And finally, early child development is another one of the bubbles in that, that illustration of the multiple determinants. It has plays a major role in uh, influencing lifelong health, and it is also strongly affected by poverty. So the second half of the report um, reviews the evidence, and we spent a, a, a lot of time with a detailed introduction to address three areas that cut across, so I'll be raising these as I go through the review of the evidence in the different chronic disease areas, with uh, the developmental origins of health and disease, this, uh, emerging concept very relevant to this topic, the underlying mechanisms through epigenetics, and then the challenges that, many challenges that arise in environmental cases in terms of the way we evaluate this evidence at all. So working through each of those three and then looking at the, um, the, the five areas of chronic disease, just, just to summarize briefly the, the concept of the developmental origins of health and disease. Um, this is basically the notion that the environment, and this broadly defined, so the, the maternal environment, so when the, uh, the mother's nutritional status during pregnancy, her, her overall health, not, not as narrowly defined as sort of environmental contaminants. So that environment sets a trajectory for lifelong health and well-being, and intrinsically people know that to be the case. Um, but we have learned over the last 50 to 60 years, and it really started with the Dutch famine in 1944, where um, babies that were in utero during that famine and were born very low birth weight ended up with higher levels of hypertension, insulin resistance, obesity, cardiovascular disease in adult life. And much more epidemiological evidence, clinical evidence, and experimental evidence um, shows that association between, in particular, low birth weight, but, but a, a 
problems in that early environment um, and later life chronic disease. And the concept is in fact expanding to include early environmental exposures. So without getting into too much detail about epigenetics, basically the, these are the underlying mechanisms that, that scientists are beginning to understand. And they're basically gene-environment interactions. They lead to, epigenetics is when those interactions lead to changes in how genes are expressed, but the, there's no underlying change in the, in the DNA sequence or the gene itself. Every cell has the same genetic information, but of course we have widely varied tissues. My, my hand is different from my eyeball. Um, that's the expression of the epigenome. Um, so if you look at identical twins, they, they aren't exactly identical. This is my sister and I at age four. Um, we've continued to change in our appearance throughout our lives, um, but those, and that's an expression of, of the epigenetic changes as a result of during growth and development um, and ongoing through life. Um, but those epigenetic um, uh, processes are particularly important during development and they can result in permanent um, changes, uh, lifelong changes. And it's increasingly understood that they underlie the toxicity, uh, these processes underlie the toxicity of many environmental exposures of concern. So we're dealing with a lot of complicated information here. Um, we've got uh, uncertain science about environmental risks for a range of reasons. Um, very complex biochemical influences on many different steps across the developmental chain. We're considering the entire life course. We're talking about low-level chronic exposure to many different substances um, in many different ways. And we can't run controlled experiments to figure this out. It would be impossible and unethical. So we try to put the, the evidence together as best we can for, from various uh, information streams. And not only is it um, a complex situation in terms of what the information we're gathering, but these aren't simple one-to-one -one relationships we're trying to identify here. They're causal webs, they're not linear systems, and there can be um, many different interrelationships, um, as I'll describe in a moment. So I won't go into too much detail on the, um, this slide, because obviously it's got too much detail in it. But basically, this is your, your standard Bradford Hill criteria for evaluating evidence. And this is still very, very useful. These are, but these are signposts. They shouldn't be hard and fast rules. Um, and there are problems that arise in applying these criteria that arise from the nature of environmental health um, case, cases. So. Um, without getting into too much detail, basically I, I've got some examples here of um, you can have bi-directional or reciprocal, whoops, reciprocal relationships, you can have interrelationships and many-to-many -many relationships, you know, where you can have low dose and developmental exposures being different than in adults. All of these things, if you look at the, the I think it's the fifth bullet down, the experts who are, who are looking at these criteria are saying we should give less weight to those, those ones where we typically give we consider more important, so strength of evidence, consistency, specificity, etc. Um, those are still important, but there's a need. This, these examples give us uh, point to the need to give greater weight to the idea of an analogy and plausibility. And when Bradford Hill developed these criteria in the 1960s, he used examples from uh, fetal exposure, thalidomide and rubella virus in particular, to illustrate that notion of analogy, where you basically take evidence from uh, one situation and apply it in analogous situations and, uh, where you have less evidence but where it, it, it appears necessary to um, take precautionary action. So just continuing in terms of the issues of, of that come up with evaluating this evidence, in statistics you, you try to avoid these two errors. Um, type 1, you, you don't want to conclude an association exists when it doesn't. And then in type 2, you can miss causal associations. And Several reviews of cases, of uh, environmental cases, I've summarized on this slide, have illustrated how this happens many times in environmental cases. They type two areas, sorry, type two errors occur a lot. So basically errors where we miss causal associations because of the nature of the evidence we're trying to um, understand. So the challenges that arise are um, in terms of how also how risk factors are defined. Um, as I go through the, the evidence about 
uh, individual um, chronic diseases, I'll, I do it in the context of, of a risk factor approach. Um, the traditional definition in public health, you can see here the, the kinds of issues that I've been talking about, the focus on personal behavior or lifestyle, this is the Government of Canada definition. Um, uh, or an environmental exposure, then the, the genetic issues, and then combining that with epidemiological evidence. That's what you, how you define a risk factor. But the problem with this, this definition is it doesn't sufficiently recognize that primary influence of the social determinants of health. Um, and when you have, if you're waiting in an environmental case study for epidemiological evidence, so effects in human populations, first of all, it's very difficult to get that evidence. And once you obtain it, it can be way too late to achieve prevention or even clean up. We saw that with lead and gasoline. Uh, we may uh, be recreating that problem with brominated flame retardants, bisphenol A, phthalates, et cetera. And there's examples of that described in the report. So um, in, the, uh, in part two of the report, um, the across the disease focused sections. I aimed for a similar treatment, so laying out the prevalence data for each and where relevant if, um, if, if there's increasing incidence across the, most of the chronic diseases that we considered, there is both high prevalence and rising incidence. Um, and taking that risk factors approach, uh, watching as I went through it for whether or not, whether and how environmental exposures are being, were considered in that evidence, um, looking at the, putting that in, the, so basically putting the environmental information into that broader context, looking at the adult exposure information, again, watching for um, relevance to early exposure, but the main focus is what's the evidence for associations between early exposures and later development of chronic disease. So starting with cardiovascular disease, the approach again between uh, for risk factors starting with non-modifiable ones, this is fairly typical, there's gender, age, there's often genetic predispositions for many chron chronic diseases. For modifiable risk factors, these are considered by large um, it, within large studies to account for about 90 percent of the risk. So these are the ones we've been ta I've talked about previously, the abnormal lipids, hypertension, abdominal obesity, and then the big three, diet, smoking, exercise. Stress is important, very important. As they looked closer at, at stress, they found that um, there's a stronger influence than some of the others. And if that is a causal relationship, it in indicates that, that there's a much greater role for stress in cardiovascular disease. And which is really important because it, it, it underlies the, the, so the social determinants of health analysis that um, these so-called modifiable risk factors are really inseparable from social living conditions. And that's also apparent because we know that there's a higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease among those in poverty. So again, bringing in this notion of fetal nutrition and the, and the developmental organs, origins of health and disease. This, this uh, evidence, um, as I mentioned, is extensive in terms of fetal and neonatal undernutrition and then later development of these major risk factors for, for cardiovascular disease in, in adult life. Um, and it can be both undernutrition or overnutrition, so um, basically it's a matter of insufficient protein. Again, but by epigenetic mechanisms, these are permanent developmental changes that can lead to those later life pathologies. Um, stress is also important. For example, it can affect the development of, of nephrons in the kidneys, which is, can, if there are reduced nephrons, that can, that can add to later life um, cardiovascular disease risk. So I'm not implying that from this research and neither of these scientists that all cardiovascular disease is developmental in origin, um, but the findings are highly relevant for, the, for this risk, especially for those living in, in poverty. So moving on to the environmental evidence um, in adults, both the American Heart Association and the Canadian Medical Association note a causal relationship with particulate air pollution and cardiovascular disease. There's strong evidence for an association with low-level lead exposure, and that could actually be from lifelong exposure. And then emerging evidence of associations with bisphenol A, um, likely via or via altered insulin signaling, it appears to be the case. And then in early life, there's three areas to look at. Cardiac birth defects, low birth weight, and endocrine disruption. So I'll talk about each of those. Um, basically what I've done here is summarize for cardiac birth defects um, the um, 
exposures that are associated with them because cardiac birth defects are a risk factor for later life um, heart disease. Um, and then for low birth weight, um, again, a, a quite a large number of substances are associated with low birth weight. The ones that are underlined are um, areas where there's greater uh, evidence, ETS is environmental tobacco smoke. Um, so it may not follow that these exposures associated with low birth weight are also contribute to that uh, latent cardiovascular disease risk, but um, a prudent concern is certainly is warranted. Um, and then with respect to endocrine disruption, the third area, um, that adult evidence where we saw a link between bisphenol A disrupting insulin signaling, um, in fact, the same is the case and it's uh, a more uh, dramatic effect where there's, when, when there is prenatal and perinatal exposure, you, you see those permanent changes in insulin metabolism. So you have a, 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 a continuum of risk for other things, other chronic diseases that are related to disruption in insulin metabolism. I'll talk about the, that more in a minute. And then for some of the other areas, uh, bisphenol A is associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome um, when there's prenatal exposure. Um, again, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and type 2 di diabetes. Um, and phthalates and PCBs affecting testosterone levels, um, also a risk factor for met metabolic syndrome cardiovascular disease, and then lead through endocrine disruption and the, affecting the stress response, again, a risk factor for CVD. So moving on to diabetes, um, I looked at the prevalence and the risk factors for both obesity and diabetes. Um, there's a clear indication, again, that, that this is a disease of the poor, I've noted some statistics there. Um, in terms of risk factors for obesity, this is an area that is far more complex than just a matter of excess food intake and insufficient physical activity. While those are important, especially in the context of our increasingly sedentary lifestyles and changes in the built environment and changes in the food system and food composition, um, when the evidence is reviewed, it is equally plausible and equally um, arising from a range, the kind of range of evidence you want to look, you want to see, so epidemiological, clinical, um, animal evidence, to say that other risk factors noted here are equally plausible. So exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, some intrauterine transgenerational things, stress, social determinants, etc. Um, so looking at, continuing on with diabetes, so we're, I'm, I'm overlapping as I go through these chronic diseases. There are many overlapping risk factors. The genetic risk factors continue to apply. Um, obesity and diabetes are themselves risk factors for cancer, Alzheimer's disease, cognitive uh, impairment, dementia, and cardiovascular disease. So the risk factors carry through, uh, and the DOHAD evidence um, is also relevant. Looking at the environmental side of this, um, I won't go in, in detail here, but this, is, this summarizes the uh, evidence about exposure in adults. So if you see across air pollution, lead, bisphenol A, phthalates, the ones listed here, you see which re what repeats is effects on insulin resistance, insulin signaling um, across the board, systemic inflammation, et cetera. So that evidence in, in adults prompted a lot of animal research, research to look at, and, and they have found that the, um, these chemicals disrupt that through endocrine pathways, um, those metabolic, um, that the metabolic homeostasis related to, to insulin um, metabolism. And it is a continuation of the DOHAD research, um, including explained by epigenetic mechanisms. Um, and it's a matter of both undernutrition and overnutrition. Um, the undernutrition were coming from that, the, um, you know, the Dutch famine, for example, they saw later life obesity after reproduction. Um, but with effects, endocrine disruption effects and, and um, obesity occurring as a result of overnutrition, either uh, overweight mothers or high birth weight babies, especially where protein is insufficient, um, you're seeing childhood and adolescent obesity, and then you can see intergenerational obesity.
Um, so again, the low birth weight and endocrine disruption issue is, is relevant. So we've got the same risk factors potentially for cardiovascular disease, environmental risk factors. And then there's the specific issue of endocrine, endocrine disruptors as the, what are referred to as obesogens. Um, so what in the endocrinologists are, are finding in, and describing um, endocrine tissue, or sorry, and describing uh, adipose or fat tissue as an endocrine organ. It's not just inert. It dynamically regulates energy expenditure, appetite, food intake, metabolism, and it's very dominantly involved in growth and development. And again, these are permanent pathways that get established during pre perinatal development. The, the DOE had evidence and epigenetic research is explaining this. And these obesogenic substances, mostly through animal evidence, um, are seen to uh, act during that time, those time periods um, by those same mechanisms. Um, and listed in the final bullet are some of the chemicals for which uh, there is a suspicion of obesogenic potential. Um, moving on to Alzheimer's disease, and I've left out, um, perhaps mercifully for getting through all of this, Alzheimer's disease. I'm sorry, I've left out Parkinson's disease from this summary. Um, the Again, uh, it's a matter of non-modifiable risk factors, um, and then among the modifiable ones, it's, there's this continuum of, of common risk factors for obesity, metabolic syndrome, type 2 di diabetes, cardiovascular disease, vascular dementia. They're on a, a continuum together. Um, we have the same uh, range of risk factors that we can consider there, and um, they are relevant to, to uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, What's really important here is those that contribute to inflammation and oxidative stress um, and then to disrupted insulin signaling um, are what's important here. And, and in fact, some researchers, researchers are calling Alzheimer's disease diabetes of the brain. And of course, the other, the other risk factors noted here, stress, poverty, um, et cetera, are also relevant. And again, because of um, inflammation and oxidative stress. So if we look at the environmental exposures across both adult exposures and early exposures, if we consider that continuum uh, among, across those other diseases already mentioned, you would bring forward those, those environmental exposures uh, to be relevant for Alzheimer's disease. Um, where there's more direct evidence, um, it's, it occurs with, with lead and air pollution. So the PCBs and some of the other persistent organic pollutants. And then for early exposures, again, there's that continuum of shared risk factors or the potential continuum, um, you know, for those, for the other diseases, therefore those environmental exposures are also relevant. Um, and again, the doe head concept and the epigenetic mechanisms um, are involved in terms of the notion of healthy brain aging resulting from um, beginning with early brain development and creation of a strong brain reserve that can handle the, the stresses and the exposures throughout the lifetime. Um, and where there are, is more direct evidence of possible associations there is with air pollution and lead. Um, just trying to get through cancer pretty quickly, this is one of the largest areas of the report um, because of course cancer is not one disease but, but many. Um, I s described the, the major risk factors um, but um, focused in on the uh, early life exposures. Um, there, there's a key role here for epigenetics. We, um, it's, it's further advanced in cancer than most, most chronic diseases in terms of increasingly um, understanding them, these mechanisms as central to, to how cancers develop and progress, um, and that they're centrally involved in, in uh, how early life events might lead to later life cancer. So I focused on three, breast, prostate, and testicular cancers, where not only is there high prevalence and rising incidence in the population, but there's evidence of environmental contributions, particularly in early life, either by direct or delayed causation and increased sensitivity to later exposures. Um, I took a very limited review of the adult evidence and then summarized the detailed evidence about greater susceptibility when exposures occur in early life. So running through the exposures for breast cancer, the stronger de strongest evidence is from um, those with sus uh, endocrine disruption, dis disrupting properties, uh, the, the persistent organic pollutants noted in the first bullet. Um, and then there are other um, endocrine disrupting substances like bisphenol A. Um, 
weaker evidence as you go down these bullets the the lev the amount of evidence gets weaker but as you can see there's a very large number of uh, potential exposures of concern here and again the mechanism is through those permanent changes during mammary gland development that can alter that later susceptibility um, to uh, factors that can initiate breast cancer and for prostate cancer, looking at exposures in adults in early life, prostate cancer is one where um, there clearly is a hormonal disruption, um, or not clearly, there's a suspected hormone, hormonal disruption mechanism um, among the, the risk factors. Um, in early life, it appears that there's an uh, endocrine-disrupting mode of action from um, fairly strong evidence both for the hormone um, synthetic hormone, DES, that was used as a drug, um, and then again the, from the very similar chemical bisphenol A. Um, we're seeing again the epigenetic mechanisms um, during early life, and similar to, to bisphenol A, this is where we're seeing um, low dose effects that are very different from high dose effects. So again, question, uh, challenging those, that notion in the Bradford Hill cr criteria, or several of the notions in the Bradford Hill criteria for evaluating evidence. And then finally, for testicular cancer, this is within the context of the notion of testicular dysgenesis syndrome, which is a hypothesis about the fetal origin of four effects on the male reproductive system, two birth defects, um, poor semen quality in later life, and then testicular cancer. Um, there's a lot of animal evidence here indicating um, these effects from endocrine disrupting substances. Um, and also very clear evidence that testicular cancer is initiated during fetal development. Um, the final, uh, the second to last bullet lists several of the chemicals that may uh, be involved here. Um, and again, it's an example of where analogy is important. Um, especially given the fact that it looks like there's a stronger effect where um, multiple substances are involved um, and there may be effects from mixtures. And finally, the final area is asthma. Um, the, even though it's mainly a disease in childhood, it can have lifelong effects. So multiple risk factors, very complex gene environment interactions, um, that's very clear. The, there's a, an effect on the immune system and effects on lifelong lung function and those can those are determined in in early life we know that from asthma the doe had evidence again um, helps to explain this situation um, well no the epigenetic evidence does that we know from the doe had ev had evidence that um, lifelong lung function is can be affected by low birth weight under nutrition and, and other factors so of course the, we bring those along as I mentioned with the other chronic diseases when you look at the environmental risk factors the first bullet describes what we know, this is fairly strong evidence about all of these um, as risk factors for asthma, either onset or as triggers. And then the, the, the two sub-bullets, there's a very large number of different kinds of air pollutants that, for which there are associations with um, uh, asthma, either onset or more often as triggers. So when you have these evidence of associations between preterm birth and air pollution, um, that's clear in, in the both epidemiological evidence and animal evidence um, that can affect lung development. Um, so again, we bring those substances along from the previous diseases already mentioned. Um, effects on the immune system, obviously, because asthma is an immune response. Um, and then some of the other substances where it appears there's a, there's a link, a, a less evidence of phthalates and bisphenol A and some of the perfluorinated compounds. So I won't go into detail on this table. I've just put it in here for the sake of completeness. I, with a bit of trepidation, I put all of it together in one table. So it's across two slides, all of these different diseases and all of the different um, substances. And a lot of detail about strength of evidence is lost in aggregating this. Um, but the idea was to see what does the whole package look like. And you see an awful lot of substances repeating, as I mentioned before. Those that are of greatest concerns often are associated with multiple diseases. So just to conclude some overall observations, um, we definitely have, from, on the basis of, of going through this um, detailed review, and I've literally hit the mountains, the, t the peaks of mountains of information in describing this. Um, there are associations between early environmental exposures with certain chronic diseases. We have lots of gaps in information and, and uncertainties. Um, 
but exposure continues despite these high stakes risks. And we've got that continuum of those shared and well-known risk factors across obesity, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease, which points to the likelihood that envir the sh environmental risk factors are also shared, including, including those um, uh, that are related to low birth weight. And then the, the chemicals or pollutants that keep coming up in, the, in that table that frequently uh, uh, recur are the air pollutants, particularly the criteria air contaminants, the smog pollutants, um, a lot of metals, especially lead, bisphenol A and phthalates, many pesticides, particularly the really nasty organochlorine pesticides, solvents, and then a range of other persistent organic pollutants. So in terms of, of uh, concluding in term of, uh, as a result of this collaboration across um, KIPCHI and OCDPA, we have um, a lot of shared goals in terms of already, in terms of health promotion and disease prevention. Um, and in terms of our collective work on chronic disease, um, it seems very clear from this work and from the literature that the, where a prevention focus is just on behavioral or lifestyle risk, factors, that that is far too narrow. Um, also the evidence, the nature of the evidence with respect to environmental case studies um, challenges how we evaluate that evidence traditionally and there's a need to address that. Um, the, the developmental origins of disease concept, there's, there's very solid evidence in support of it and it's very rapidly expanding to include um, early life exposures. And finally, the in terms of of overlap between KIPCHI and OCDPA, these issue, the issue of low birth weight and nutrition issues, especially the evidence of, of um, impacts on insulin signaling where these are permanent changes from uh, prenatal exposures are um, of particular importance. And what we've basically accomplished with doing this work is really just, even though the, the scope is quite large, is really just a solid foundation now for further collaboration um, to work on chronic disease prevention efforts. So I will stop there with a range of acknowledgments because a lot of people were involved in this project and the report is posted to the website of the Canadian Environmental Law Association and the KIPCHI website, healthyenvironmentforkids.ca. So I will stop there and thank you for your time. Thank you.